For those of you who are visiting today, I want to kind of explain something real quick. We have our prayer service prior to going live. And uh, I assume we are live right now? Yes. Okay. So we are live right now, and we kind of start things over again. Not with another prayer service, but uh, with the regular service. And um, I hope you can be patient with the way we, we do things around here. Uh, but we're trying to satisfy two audiences. This one here, this congregation, and the and the one that uh, is possibly home ridden mm -hmm. and has to watch this on uh, Facebook or uh, YouTube. Uh, I do want to welcome everybody once again to this church, First Christian Church, 105 Red Bud, Mount Pleasant, Texas. And uh, for you at home watching this, we welcome you also. Uh, for y'all. We celebrate an open communion in this church. You are certainly welcome to participate in that communion. It is for all believers. Uh, if you would, please have with you a piece of bread or a cracker or something to represent the body of Christ. Also, some type of liquid to drink. Uh, it can be milk, water, OJ, grape juice. doesn't matter uh, to represent the blood of Christ. And then you can participate in that with us. Also, if you'd like to receive a bulletin weekly in the mail so you can follow the service better, uh, if you will contact us, our address, phone numbers on the Facebook page, we'll get that to you. If you're in need of a Bible or a hymnal, we will also be glad to forward that uh, to you. If you have prayer concerns, uh, please give that to us, and we'll address that in our prayer service, which starts prior to us going live, as I said earlier. Um, we would, though, be blessed if uh, you found your way to our front door and uh, worshiped with us on a Sunday. Our service actually starts at 9.30 in the morning, and we'd love to have you with us. At this time, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll all conclude that prayer together, saying that prayer that Christ taught his disciples. Will you please bow your heads? Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you for the life, the death, the life of Jesus Christ, your Son. The Christ came to this, this earth so we could experience God on earth. He gave his life because he loved each and every person, not only here in this church, but throughout time. And he gave it in a way that is completely repulsive to the point that it's hard for any of us to imagine what he went through in that. Dear Lord, on that third day, on that Sunday morning, when the women found the stone rolled away, we praise you that he was free from that, that tomb before that stone was rolled back. Dear Lord, we thank you for the works of the apostles, who if it were not for the 11 and then later Paul, none of this would be taking place. Their evangelism, their efforts, their travels, their preaching, their, their converting, their baptizing. Dear Lord, we praise you for each and every one of their lives. Dear Heavenly Father, for this little church on Red Bud, we praise you for it, for the facility that we have here, for the, the comfortable conditions that we, that we experience every Sunday, the church family, the extended family that we have that would stand up for any individual in this church that suffered or, or needed help. Dear Lord, I thank you for the, for the young ones that are here today. 
And by that, I'm talking about anybody under 60. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, let the world know that this is not about an Easter bunny. Please let us help the world know that this is about your son, Jesus, the Christ. All this I lift up to you in the name of your precious son. As we continue his prayer together in saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. turn to hymn number 218 thine is the glory we'll sing all verses chapter verse 16 his disciples did not understand these things at first however when Jesus was glorified 
Then they remembered that these things had been written about him. And, and that they had done these things, things to him. If you will turn <clears throat> to page 224, Christ arose as we prepare for communion. We will sing. Sorry. <coughs> the pages are wanting to stick together. We will sing all three verses. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. In this troubled world, even at this time, in this place, it is really difficult to concentrate on higher things. Isn't it? But we can't always use that excuse. For it's always been so, and will always be so, at least for the foreseeable future, until he comes again. As Paul reminds us, if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Colossians 3, 1 through 4. Again, Paul tells us, For I received from the Lord what I had delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, he also took the cup 
after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. First Corinthians. Let us pray. O oh God, <clears throat> who in Jesus Christ turned the defeat of Good Friday into the victory of Easter, bringing dawn out of darkness and life out of death, make us faithful witnesses to the life-giving power of your cross-bearing love. Keep us ever mindful of the risen one's promise as he sat at the table with Peter, who denied him thrice, with John and James, who were priding to be first, with Matthew, who was a publican and a sinner, and with Judas, who had the kiss of death. As every man was and is tangled in self-love, self-pity, and dark fear, he gave us bread and wine himself. O oh, bread, put flesh on the ribs of our thin souls, and from this cup pour fire to kindle us to be thy people. Amen.
when it comes to tithes and offerings. There are a few better ways that you can say it than Paul says it in the second letter of Corinthians, chapter 9, verses 6 through 8, which is quite clear. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he's decided in his heart. Not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that you'll have sufficiency in all things and at all times that you will abound in good work. There is a basket in the back of the sanctuary. On Facebook, there is a donate button. And last heard, the U.S. mail still works for checks. Let us pray. O oh God, giver of great gifts, we thank you for your greatest gift to us in your Son on this day so long ago. We can but add our smaller gifts to your house and service and ask that you bless them to that end. Amen. If you are able, as we read our scripture this morning, which is found in Luke, the 24th chapter, verses 1 through 12. Here begins our reading. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wandering about, wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their, right, in their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to, to himself what had happened. Here ends our reading. You may be seated. In uh, our family's preparation for Easter, I had asked Karen uh, if she was able to find her a new uh, Easter hat to wear. And uh, she said she wasn't able to find one. Now, I offered, and Steve, you'll appreciate this, one of my old cowboy hats to wear. And she wouldn't do it. Now, to further involve her, in the start of this. I don't know if you noticed the title to the sermon, Seashells and Easter. 
when she asked me what the Sam Hill one had to do with the other. And I told her she'd just have to be in mystery all week long, and she'd find out on Sunday. And uh, she's made comments about that several times this week. But as far as that title goes, when I was a little boy, uh, my grandmother lived with us, and my grandmother had a large conch shell. Now, I don't know where that old shell came from. Uh, I doubt if she ever went to the beach. You know, it could be that somebody brought it to her from a vacation. I, I just don't know. But what I remember is holding that conch shell to my ear and being told that I could hear the ocean in it. As a child, I believed it. I'd hold that shell up to my ear and, and I'd stick a finger in my other ear and I'd listen to the, the soft roar coming out of that shell. Well, it's pretty neat for a little boy who lived quite a ways from the beach. It, it wasn't a life-changing experience, but it was an early lesson into the mysterious nature of our world. Now, yes, as I grew up, many of the mysteries of life were explained through one scientific method or another, and the roar in the old conch shell was, was easily explained, yet there's something uh, awe-inspiring in those mysteries, something that just makes us want to say, wow. One such mystery that still remains is the resurrection, that which we celebrate on Easter. Now, there is much that is mysterious in our world. Perhaps it goes beyond the mysterious, I mean, almost to the, the point or the level of magical. And I want you to think about it. Tree leaves. Trees lose their leaves every winter and grow new ones every spring. How does that happen? Flowers also know when and how to grow from seeds. I'm sure you've all seen azaleas in full bloom. They're they're magnificent. It happens every year like clockwork. Caterpillars withdraw into a cocoon and, and emerge as a butterfly. Babies. Babies. Started from the, the meeting of, of two individual cells. And, know, and they know just how to divide into the individual cells parts and organs that make up a human body. At a specific point, specific point in that development, a heartbeat begins. Have you ever asked yourself, how does it know to do that? It's mysterious and magical. In the same vein, who knows what the signal is that causes labor to begin. No science can tell us how those events happen. But still, there is a mysterious nature that lies behind them. What brought about these events of nature to be the way that they are? What makes the world operate as it does? What determined the building blocks of life in the universe? Yep, I know that science has an answer for some of it. 
and uh, some think all of it, but I would like people to just save their technological jargon. I know there are processes and theories, but any and every attempt to explain them is incomplete. They fall flat. They cannot e completely explain the mysterious, magical part of what happens in any of those occurrences. Possibly because they fail to explain the purpose of the phenomena in the first place. Explanation and facts are only half the story and never really account for all that we experience. Now, someone may tell me the physical, scientific, religious uh, reason for the sound that I heard in that seashell. The shape of the shells just happened to make them great amplifiers of ambient noise. Any air that makes its way into the shell's cavity gets bounced around by its hard, curved inner sur surfaces. The resonating air produces sound. Yes. Tell me that. But the ocean is still in that shell. Just a smaller version. It's still just as mysterious and magical to me. It would still make me say, wow. Luke's gospel today finds us at the grave of Jesus. It is early on Sunday morning. Jesus had been laid to rest on Friday afternoon. Saturday was the Sabbath. And so it was not until this morning of the third day that the women who had followed Jesus and who also had prepared the necessary spices and ornaments to embalm him were able to return to the tomb in order to prepare his body. Can you imagine their surprise to find that tomb open. Visualize in your mind their reaction to finding his body gone. Picture their response to two men standing by the tomb. Why are you looking for the living among the dead, they say. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee? Yeah. Yeah. Now that you mention it, we do. Remembering that Jesus taught, the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and rise on the third day. For the women, it would be one of those mysterious, magical moments when, wow, would be an understatement. No matter what else happened, at that moment, they heard the ocean and the seashell. They saw and they believed. Their almost instantaneous belief is remarkable. Did they ask or wonder how it could be? Did they stop to contemplate the, the, the possibilities? No, they just rejoiced in the moment. They ran back to tell the disciples and, and everyone else what had happened. It wasn't until they got back to the disciples that they meet with skepticism. Impossible. Unexplainable. It can't be. 
the disciples called it nonsense and they didn't believe. That seems to be the condition of the world today. So many people refuse to believe what is not tangible, what cannot be explained, or what I like to call the supernatural. For so many years, our ability to reason anything out has been so highlighted that we have no trust of anything without a reasonable, logical, science-based explanation. This is compounded by reason's failure to explain everything to us. You know, logic and education has pretty much let us down. The mystery still remains. It's not logical. The resurrection cannot be explained. Assuming that God exists, it is not logical to believe that God and humanity could mix together in the form of one human body. It can't be explained or settled on. Neither could one return to life after experience, experiencing death for a good portion of three days. Life can't begin again once death is complete. And it's only the, the resurrection of Jesus that people have trouble with. Excuse me, it's not only the resurrection of Jesus that people have trouble with. The Bible itself is an irrational book, full of inconsistencies, improbabilities, impossibilities, and some would say fairy tales. It is bittersweet to suggest this morning that such, such people can't experience the mystery and magic of the resurrection just as it was to the disciples. It doesn't make sense. I wonder if the ability to believe has dried up from years of influence on society and the progress of science and technology at such a rapid speed. The mystery of the resurrection requires reclaiming our ability to have faith in what can't be explained or understood. We have to begin with the tangible, the teachings of Jesus the Christ and move to the unbelievable, the resurrection. Notice, though, what Peter does. He falls somewhere in the middle. He doesn't quite go all in with this tale that the women share, but neither does he jump on the nonsense bandwagon with the other disciples who don't believe what the women tell them. He simply decides that he has to see for himself. He, he goes to the tomb, looks inside, you know, I imagine that he reaches over and he, and he fondles those grave linens, those clothes that were lying there. Then he returns home, as Luke tells us, amazed at what had happened. Can we imagine his footsteps as he makes his way back to the the upper room, totally awestruck. I bet he's playing the events of the last few days, 
plus the last three years over in his head. He is remembering, just as the women were called to do, what Jesus told them concerning events that would happen in Jerusalem. Oh, his heart wants to believe. He wants to believe that he's hearing the ocean in the seashell. But logic makes him afraid to do so. You know, I think Peter's attitude reflects where most of us find ourselves here this Easter morning. Peter most definitely believed in Jesus during his ministry. Yet it's also true that Peter experienced doubt and turned away during his three denials just two days short of this. Luke indicates that it is with caution that Peter begins to believe in the resurrection. And it seems to be with reluctance that we believe in the resurrection as well. You know, I wonder if our hesitation is what makes the difference in our celebration of Easter and Christmas. We love to celebrate Christmas and we go all out with lights and trees, decorations and endless gatherings. Our celebration of Easter is more subdued. Maybe because it's a good Friday. But I suspect it has more to do with refusing to hear the ocean in the seashell. Now, I'll admit without Christmas, Easter morning would never come. But it is even more truth that without Easter morning, the meaning of Christmas would be forever changed. Christmas loses its purpose without Easter. Yet we seem to let Easter slip in and out so quietly. It seems that we let it be just another day with the exception of a few new hats, dresses, and a Reese's egg or two. We don't seem to proclaim it so loudly. Our celebration and its meanings seem subdued compared to Christmas. Are we wanting to believe in the impossible but afraid to really do so? Are we afraid to make a big deal about it because we can't really explain it? Yes, we believe in the resurrection, but we say it in quiet voices. Think about it. Think about the wonder of it all this Easter morning. Perhaps like Peter, our, our hearts beat a little faster as we begin to contemplate the implications of the resurrection. If we were there this morning, standing beside the tomb, what would our reaction be? Would we rejoice and share our experience with, with everyone? Would, would people be able to, to see a, a difference in us because of our experience? Or would we be skeptical? Would we be, would we be looking for reasonable and logical explanations 
when we try to explain it all away? Could we begin to tentatively believe in the mystery of the discovery? Would everything that we had come to know with our mind as truth and reality take on new meaning because of what we now believe with certainty in our hearts? The message this morning and it is really simple. Claim the mystery of the resurrection as your own. Don't try to explain it. Don't even try to understand it. Just believe it. And you know something? You might discover there's an ocean in that seashell. Childish? Probably so. But I remind myself that Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Don't stop them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I assure you, whoever does not welcome the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Mark 10, verses 14 and 15. He is risen. He is risen. Amen. By the way, I want to thank the Reverend Dr. Diedrich for taking on this uh, new assignment with the table at the church. That's a hard thing for me to give up, I want you to know. But I think it's in good hands. And I think it adds more to our service by having him give a whole new outlook on what that table is about. Our hymn of invitation today is on page 225. I know that my Redeemer liveth. We're going to do the first and the third verse. And this morning, if, uh, if you have felt that spirit moving within you, you feel that it's time to come forward and, and confess your faith in Jesus Christ, please do so. If you at home are of this same feeling, you can do it right where you're at. Just please get in contact with us and let us know about it. We want to celebrate with you. If also there's someone here today that wants to re-proclaim their faith in Christ, to rededicate themselves to the church and the church's works, Please come forward, or if you're just in need of special prayer, you're welcome to come forward during this hymn. It's on page 225. I know that my Redeemer liveth. Verses 1 and 3, and would you please stand?
<laughs> you know, I said some earlier about no Easter hats, but here's an Easter hat for you. Texas style. Can't have falsified. Stephanie. Yeah. Why are you here this morning? Uh, I'm here to uh, proclaim. Pro, uh, I can't talk. I'm sorry. Proclaim. Proclaim my faith in the Lord and Jesus. Okay. And get baptized. Okay. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to ask you a couple of questions. Oh boy. Okay. Number one, do you accept and believe that you? Along with everybody here today, is a sinner. Yes. Do you believe that it is only through <laughs> Christ Jesus that you can be forgiven of those sins? Yes. Do you believe that He took the burden of those sins and put them on Himself just for you? Yes. Do you accept Him as your Lord and Savior? And do you accept Him as Him, the leader of your life? God the Father, and Jesus the Son, the Holy Spirit, representing them here in this church, I want to welcome you in to the family of Christ. You're not reborn into this church. You'll be reborn into the body of Christ, the whole bailiwick, the whole world over. We will schedule at y'all's convenience and your timing a baptismal service for you where you will be buried as Jesus was buried and you'll be brought to your new life. And I want to thank you. I want to thank you so very much for coming forward. And I will try to make sure that the heater's working for the baptism. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or we'll both be in and out real quick. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we know half the time. <laughs> Just float on the water. <laughs> Will you please bow your heads? Dear most gracious and wonderful Heavenly Father, thank you, dear Lord, for this blessed moment. This time when another being, another child of yours, has come forward to represent you and to witness you on this planet. We praise you, dear Lord, that that you brought this family to this church in the first place and all that they're meaning to us. Especially Stephanie. <laughs> I just, I kind of wish that this morning to start out the broadcast they'd got that little spat that her and Matthew were having on film. <laughs> <laughs> so we shared that with the whole world <laughs> as to how really true family we are. In Jesus' name and say, Amen. 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 And I would like each and every person to come up and, and just to greet Steph and let her know what you're thinking right now. Mm -hmm. And this service is concluded. <laughs> I've been mistaken with the fuzz before, so no big deal. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> we took a little string there to keep it from falling. Oh, it's a string.